Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Women of the Military Podcast. I'm really excited to have Darlene here. We got to chat a little bit before the interview started, so I know that she has so much knowledge and so much information, and you guys stay stay tuned so you can hear all of it. Uh, but we always start with, why did you decide to join the military? So, Darlene, can you share that with us? Uh, I joined the military for two reasons. Number one, my dad served in the army and so did his friends and they hung out on our porch quite a bit. Uh, number two, I lost both of my parents at an early age and I was an only child. So it became just me. And part of being in the military is that camaraderie and that family that you feel no matter where you are, no matter what country, what city, what town, what state, and I knew I needed that because I didn't have uh, the normal family, like aunts, uncles, cousins. I didn't have all of that because my parents were only children. <laughs> they were only children. And so both sets of their parents were already deceased, which left me uh, by myself. Yeah, that sounds really, really challenging. How old were you when your parents passed away? 16. Oh, wow. So... What did your life go? You went from being like in a home with parents and then like no one because your, well, your grandparents yeah. were gone. Your parents were gone. Yeah, parents, grandparents were gone. I lost one set at nine, one set at 11. So they were already gone. Um, I was actually already in my first year of college because I graduated high school at 16, uh, went on to university and I was in my first year of college, lost my mom. I was trying to go back and, and say, okay, well, I've got another three years. I can stick this out because my dad's here. And then when I lost him, it was like, okay, that this is not working. I'll try something different. Um, and the different was I should go to the military. I mean, he was always talking about the camaraderie and how close they were. And he came back with a lot of guys and they remained friends. They remained, you know, buddies where they go shoot pool or they go drink scotch or they smoke cigars, but they always were happy and thankful just to be back from the war, able to talk about it and, and share with people things that you don't see on TV or you don't hear on television and let you know that as long as you've got a, a, a village of a community that is sticking close to you going, reminding you, you've got somebody at home waiting for you it makes a lot of sense. And so I was like, okay, let, let me see what that is. Uh, I started out in Army ROTC and I liked Army ROTC. Problem was they didn't take girls in the infantry at that time. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be in infantry. I was like, I want to be, I really wanted to be, I was like, I want to be like my dad. I want to be in infantry. And they were like, no, but we can let you do. And they gave me this whole list and I was like, mm-mm. I don't want to do any of that. So <laughs> I said, let me go over here and talk to this other recruiter. I talked to an Air Force recruiter and he said, well, why not communications? Because my major in college was literally journalism. And I thought, yeah, that fits. That fits perfectly. And I went on to do that. So initially you were in college and you learned about Army ROTC and so you tried that out. But then when you found out you couldn't do infantry, you were like, mm, let's find something else. And so you ended up with an Air Force recruiter who Air saw Force. your degree was communications and got you into the public affairs community or career field. He, actually, he got me into uh, more of the communication fields where I was literally working with lots of rules, regulations. Things, yeah, it it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but that's okay, because in that in learning about the rules and the regulations, I was literally a part of a team who we sat with binders, probably about I don't know four or five hundred page thick, and you go through each page, and some general, some colonel is going to say no, delete this and put that, delete this and put that. And your handwriting, you're lining through in your handwriting, and then you send this book back to whence it came, because at that time they had the type, you know, it was a typewriter where they had the little roll ribbons. That person had the bigger problem. I felt like I had a great job. I'm just reading. I'm going, I'm looking at what he says, change. This is a change. This is a delete. This is, this doesn't go here. This is an amendment. And I just put in the changes by hand 
And then I make sure that that huge binder gets to the, the, the correct person who is going to now retype this whole thing up <laughs> to make sure that all of these changes and, and corrections and amendments are there. Uh, I also worked with, from, from Hickam Air Force Base, I worked with all the bases on the island to manage correspondence, manage parts, work with recreation. So we had a whole lot of moving parts. For sure. Yeah. So it wasn't quite exactly what that's sometimes that's sometimes that happens. It's like, don't you want to do this? And you're like, yes. And then you're like, wait, this is not what you said. Um, but it does sound like it was related, just not quite exactly not what quite. you were expecting. Not quite. So how quickly after you talked to the Air Force recruiter did you go to basic training? Um, I talked to the recruiter in, I want to say, November. And two days before my birthday in January, I was sitting in basic training. Okay. So it wasn't that long, but a nope. few months. So what was basic training like? For me, basic training was, uh, it's in, it, there were 61 women that I did not know. And you're looking at someone who is more of an introvert than an extrovert. Uh, so I played violin, viola, cello, piano, and I sang. And those were my exteriors. Not only that, I ran cross country. So those were my ways to get rid of, you know, stuff exteriorly. But as so far as, okay, I'm just going to hang around a bunch of people. That really was my thing. Um, at With that many women, the one thing that stuck out to everybody is when it was mail call, I got nothing. When it was time to make phone calls, I had nobody to call. And so the, huh, the, the, the sergeant there says, you're, you're going to lead these 61 women. And I thought to myself, mm, no, I'm not interested in that because I don't, this one's from Chicago. That one's from Ohio. This one's from New York. And they, I'm from Louisiana. So I have a totally different attitude. It's like real calm, collected. Hey, y'all, how you doing? And literally, that's how I walked in. Hey, y'all, how y'all doing? And everybody's giving me this look like, what is she saying and where did she come from? As you can see, I no longer have that. Um, I never got jumped. If you're thinking that in your head, no. What happened was he assigned me to do a job and that began a career of leadership for me where, okay, these are the rules and this is how we got to make it happen. Um, one of the things that I remember quoting myself is saying, we're going to get on our flight. We're going to beat those guys over there. Literally, they were guys. And I think nobody had that thought because we had a couple of people who were on a, what they call chunky chicken program and they were overweight. Right. And so we're doing this optical course and I'm screaming behind this. I'm like, come on, Basin, we can do it. And in my head, I'm going, I've already went over this wall twice. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, but I need you to go over this wall because if you don't, we're all going to have to do this again. Um, and I didn't want her to get recycled because that was one of the things. OK, you can't do it now. We're going to send you back and you're going to do this all over again, not just the course but the whole basic training. And I thought, how horrible could that be? And how, how does, how much does it take your self-esteem down that you, it's like repeating second grade. Come on. It's like repeating second grade. And I told the lady, it's like, we're a team. If one falls, we all fall. And they thought, okay. I said, so let, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this optical course again with her. So we did do the course again with her. They allowed us to do that. Um, and then when we got ready to do our run, it was everybody watch the white t-shirt in front of you, listen to the cadence that are coming in my mouth and just listen to the feet. And when I started calling cadence and they started running, they were listening to the feet. We all had on white t-shirts and we did get on our flight. Uh, I still have the shirt that says 3711 on our flight. Um, so when I have that, I look at that shirt and I go, I know how to be a leader, not because I was forced, because it was already here. I love that story. And I love that the sergeant like saw something in you that you didn't even know was inside you. He like he was like, you're going to be in charge. And you're mm -hmm. like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then 
you showed like so many great aspects of leadership of, you know, helping the weakest member and making sure like one fails, we all fail. And like just having that, you know, camaraderie and group experience of and setting a goal that nobody probably even thought about. You're like, we're going to be on our flight. And and you did it. That's just that's so cool. I love hearing that story. That's so awesome. Well, here's the thing. you When you're even in life, you're never really by yourself. Unless you choose to be, it's a choice. You make the choice to uh, interact or not interact. It, it's just like this podcast. If I've decided, oh no, I don't want to do the podcast because I'm afraid of what people think. Okay, well, that's a thing in me. That's not a thing in the audience, right? So when you're not feeling confident in self, you're not going to exude that confidence. Now, even a shy person can exude confidence. Uh, I have a major. I know her very well. And she had no intention of ever being a major or being a leader. But the encouragement of it's already there. You don't have to look for it. It's already there. But then the question becomes, what kind of leader do you choose to be? Are you going to be the kind of leader who can lead from the front, lead from the back, lead from the middle, lead from the side? So you're the whole box. Or are you just going to be the guy that screams from the front? Because for me, it's about allowing the people around me to make the proper choices. OK, I'm going to give you all of the well, what's the metaphor I use with little kids? I'll give you all of the candy. But you've got to choose which one you want. And that's the same thing with adults. I'll give you all of this, but you've got to choose which one you want. I realize that being a leader, sometimes you have to modulate how that comes out because everybody doesn't take it the same way. Some people are more sensitive than others. So where I had someone screaming at me during basic training, which I wasn't accustomed to at all because in our house, we didn't do screaming, but I became adjusted to lowering the volume in my head. Not telling, can't tell him to lower the volume. So lower the volume in your head, right? You take it, basic training. And I tell people this who've never been in the military because they always think it's something else. They watch TV and they think it's something else. It's mostly mental. Then it becomes emotional. And the physical just happens. I, I was a track star, a tennis player, basketball player, all before I ever got to basic training. So the physical wasn't an issue. But I lived in a household where my parents did not yell and scream and use cuss words and push each other around. They sat down, and I say this to anybody, my parents sat down like diplomats. Somebody had tea. And something, somebody has scotch and something, and now they're talking and they never talked over each other. He would say, would you like to go first? And she said, no, be my guest. And she would listen to everything he had to say. And she listened, not just to hear him say it, but to understand from his perspective, what things looked like. And then she would repeat back to him, so you're saying X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Now he's either going to confirm or deny. If he denies, then she'll say, well, can you explain that a little bit deeper? Can you expound on that? That's a conversation. That's not an argument. And he did the same for her. When you have a conversation with, with anybody, whether it's your partner or your friend, your kids, if there's no yelling and screaming, that, that shows a level of respect, but also a level of empathy and restraint that needs to be exhibited if you're going to go past that situation, bring closure to that, and move on. Yeah, so much great wisdom. And I mean, it's it's amazing how much you can learn from the military and how it brings that out of you and like all the leadership training and everything combined. It just really helps you. My husband just got put in a leadership role for 
Cub Scouts. And it's been really interesting because people were like, he needs to be in charge. He's a leader. And we have noticed that they weren't doing things that they should have done. But it's because people aren't trained the way the military trains you. Like, do this, document this, do this. And so it's been interesting to be like, and I told them, like, you need to tell them, like, hey, I'm in the military, so I'm going to do things the military way. And if you guys don't like it, let me know and we can adjust. But, like, these are the things that need to be in place that aren't there. But also still being open to hearing, like, what people say, not just, like, we're doing it this way. This is, like, the highway or my way. It's No, it's right, right. give us input, but this is why I'm doing it and being open because the military has a huge impact on your life and they noticed that that he was a leader and that's why they asked him to do this but it also comes with okay you noticed he was a leader but this is how he was trained to be a leader and so it's been right. really interesting last few weeks uh with him taking on this new role but so, so it's, how are the, the kids that he's he's Leading. So he's in charge of, well, we're dealing with, he, the Cub Scouts are anyone under fifth grade, so kindergarten to fifth grade, but the pay, there's a lot of parent involvement, and so it's the parents aspect of, you know, the den leaders who are, um, he's the Cub Master, and then there's den leaders, so I'm a den leader now because he got promoted, so then they needed someone to fill in, and so we, the den leaders work directly with the kids, he's more right. managing the adults and helping to make sure oh, all, all that stuff. Oh, 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 okay. yeah. yeah. No, he's not telling the kids. No, he's telling the parents. So, <laughs> no, but it's been really fun. And uh, it's been a, a learning experience for me as well. So it's been really, it's been really interesting just to hang out with civilians because most of the leadership opportunities have been with military people. And so it's totally different when you're with people who haven't been in the military. So. <laughs> Yeah, and it is. It is. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate enough that my dad was in the army, uh, and that kind of gave me um, breadcrumbs of how this was going to work. But I also realized that as the military evolves, things change. Um, the young, my younger son was in the army, and his wife was in the National Guard. My older son was in, is in the Air Force, and his wife in the Air Force, and he's actually about to retire. So yeah, <laughs> he's about to retire. So, and I, every time I talk, it's, it's, it's different changes that have taken place from the eighties when I was in to now, there are a lot of changes, a lot of things that are different. A lot of things now that probably took place uh, when we were both in the military, but now they're being exposed. No, there's been a lot, a lot of change. Even since mm -hmm. I got out, which is 2013, there's so many things that have changed. And this new generation is demanding that change. And the military is struggling to meet their recruitment goals. So they have to change to continue to recruit people. And so it's been an interesting dynamic to watch that aspect of it, for sure. So you were in what, the Army? I was in the Air Force. Go blue. Uh, <laughs> go blue. And, and not the, hey, I got on both sides, uh, at, you know, the Army and the Air Force. So I'm a uh, National Guard. I'm not a problem. Friends who are Marines, Navy, I've got the whole gambit. Um, and still, you know, it's it's okay. Uh, when I do um, mediations and things, I'm always working with Coast Guards. I'm like, okay, we're all one big happy family. We yeah. may not be happy no. all the time, but we're happy 90% of the time. That works for me. Yeah. No, I've had the opportunity to talk to people from all the branches, except for the Space Force. Uh, my mm -hmm. husband's in the Space Force, but it's a little bit more complicated to find Space Force people because a lot of the work they do is not something they can talk about. And because right. it's, it's such a new branch, there's not very many veterans. So, yeah. Yep. So, I understand. Um, I actually have a coworker, and her son was given the choice. Hey, you want to go to Space Force or you want to go to Air Force? And at first he thought Space Force, Space Force. And then he looked at all the stuff that went with it. He goes, Air Force, Air Force. And he literally just graduated this weekend. So from the, uh, you know, from Air Force basic training, and he's on his way to tech school. 
So it's going to be awesome. fun just kind of watching how that evolves uh, and see what comes next. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was telling me, like, doesn't everyone in the Space War know, know each other? And I was like, maybe in like 10 years. But right now we all like transferred in. So, you know, like we <laughs> a lot of the lieutenants go to a air and space basic course. And so you meet a bunch of lieutenants from the Air Force. But they create that for lieutenants for the Space Force. So there's so few people they'll all get to know each other but now it's like nobody really knows each other because <laughs> we all came from all over but you will they will I, I believe that it's going to evolve into a bigger community where it people are going to know each other and that's just how it's going to be yeah but it just takes time like everything um but let's get back to your story we only made it to basic training and it's been 20 minutes so uh it sounds like you went to hawaii is that where you went first or is that a later well, assignment well the first place they sent me was biloxi mississippi so i went to keesler air force base first uh and then hawaii and there was nothing wrong with keesler keesler was it was close to louisiana i'm from louisiana so it was close to home uh, I could drive to New Orleans in little or no time and, and go eat or just go hang out. Um, but then when I got, I really, really wanted Hickam. And it was amazing. I, I remember being in the dorms and I had a roommate who was an air traffic controller. And she was like, did you get your orders yet? And I was like, no, I didn't get my orders yet. She goes, well, where do you think you're going? I said, oh, I'm going to Hickam. And she said, you said that with like a perfectly clear face. And I said, yeah. Because I am. She goes, you do know you don't get to choose where you go. They send you. I said, that's fine, but I'm going to Hickam. <laughs> I'll send you a postcard, pineapples, coconuts, whatever they got over there. I'll send you one. And she laughed. I'll never forget she laughed. And she says, I'm going to take a shower. And because, you know, she was going, she was headed out. I was like, okay. So she went to take her shower and I was already getting dressed. And I was saying to myself, I'm going to Hickam. Air Force Base right after this one. That's that's what they're going to do. They're going to give me orders and I'm going to go. And when I got my orders, literally, I was shocked because <laughs> I was like, ooh, I got Hickle. I've got Hickle. Um, and it was amazing to me um, just to just the whole get there. We got off the plane. They put lays on our necks and that smells so good. And I'm like, I'm here. I'm here at my dream base. Uh, and enjoyed every minute of it. Every minute. That's awesome. I love your confidence. You're like, no, that's where I'm going. And then you're like, what? I got it. <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> Understand, um, being from Louisiana, the one thing that was instilled in me was faith. If you don't have faith, um, what, what really do you have? You can't have you know, you can't hold on something that you can see because things like that disappear. But why not try holding on to something you can't see? And so God was something I held on to. Even after losing my parents, I thought, you know what? I can't see the air, but I'm breathing. You know, I can feel the sun, but I'm not really seeing the sun because the sun is like way, way up there. Uh, I can see the moon, but it's way, way up there. I said, I can hear things that I don't see. Like there's birds, but you can't, you know, you, you're walking past something, you know, the birds there, they're fine. You hear the crickets and there's all this other stuff going on. Like when you're in science class, they're telling you about neurons and atoms and all of these things you can't see, but you believe they're there, right? You believe that they're there. So I believe strong enough that I'm going to go to Hickam. And when you put that energy out there, something has to happen. So true. That is so true. So what did you do after Hawaii or Hickam? After Hickam was, ooh, Dias Air Force Base because I went, then I, I was married and that was his next station. So we went to Dias, we went to Texas and we left there and we went to Tinker. And I thought, ooh, ow. And then it was Elmendorf. And I was like, yay. And I never oh, thought cool. being from Louisiana, I would love to know. But I absolutely loved, loved, loved it. I was like, okay, this is perfect for me. I can handle this. 
And a lot of people are like, oh my God, is it dark seven, six months out of the year? No. <laughs> no, I was in Anchorage. It was not dark six months out of the year. I enjoyed the, the staying of the sun for so long because it allowed my family to do a lot of things that normally in the States you wouldn't do. It's nighttime. You know, if it's eight o'clock at night, it's dark here. But eight o'clock at night there during the summer, it's like 8 a.m. in the morning. And you can, but you just have to be mindful. Okay, it's nighttime. The animals are, that are usually asleep are now out. You know what I mean? Those nocturnal friends are running around because they think that you guys are in the house sleep. But we we went with our neighbors. We had a whole neighborhood that went camping and we went hiking and we did all these things together and it was fun. It was fun to do. Wow. So how long did you stay in the Air Force? Did you do a full 20 years? Oh, no, 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 no. I got out. Uh, I did uh, at least four and a half years. I got out and I became one of the things that I really wanted to be, which was a singer. And I sang and I performed all over the United States and uh, joined, I had was with a band. I actually performed in the military as well. And I just lived my life. I, I, <laughs> I enjoyed doing things that involved music and I was a mom and I was a wife and those things were good for me. That's awesome. So did, how so did you get out at did you get out of the military when you left Hawaii and then went to Texas or was it while you were in Texas? When did no, you become I got a military out, spouse? I got out of the military in Hawaii okay. and then traveled with my husband wherever he went. And it sounds like you guys got to go all over. We got to go all over, but it also allowed me to come back to the grounding of music. It allowed me to come back to the grounding of writing. Um, I wrote several poetry, pieces of poetry, which were placed in multiple anthologies, received a presidential award, in fact, two presidential awards for my poetry. And, you know, I just kept going. I wrote a couple of scripts, finished up college three or four different times and got several degrees. And I thought, okay. And once I got to California, um, we decided, okay, this is where we're going to be for a while. Um, I decided to earn a degree in psychology because what I wanted to do was work with military veterans who were coming back from wars and their families because it, when you come back, you're not the same as when you went. And I figured that out and I decided that's something I wanted to do. I wanted to work with families. I wanted to work with couples, but I definitely wanted to work with veterans because I recognized we're this group of people that everybody thinks the VA takes care of us. And I was like, that's not how that works. There's so many of us that the VA is inundated and we need to be able to have outside sources that goes, we're really going to take care of you. But if it's a military veteran, they understand better than someone who's never served in the military. Um, when I was diagnosed with PTSD, it took them five years. They couldn't figure it out. Why are you stressed out about this? Why does this give you anxiety? Blah, 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 blah. And then they finally figured out, oh, it's this. Yeah. But why did it take you so long? But see, that was going through the VA. That wasn't coming to the outside. When I went to an outside uh, source, it took her three, three months and she was like, okay, so this is what's going on with you. And this is why that's going on with you. And it has to do with all of this stuff that comes right here at your door. And it's always going to be at your door. Here are the coping mechanisms. Now, the VA tried to give me acupuncture in my fingers. Yeah, they had acupuncture in my fingers, acupuncture in my ears. And I thought, okay, you're causing me pain. <laughs> you're causing me pain. That's not getting rid of the, the issue. You're doing something else. And... I finally went to an actual actual puncturist and I'm telling him where the pain is. And they're saying, okay, your shoulders, your back, this is all stress and it's all lodged right here. It goes straight down this. Here's how we, and I've never been afraid of acupuncture needles, which is strange. But when a phlebotomist comes to take my blood, I have, mm -mm, we're not friends. 
<laughs> We're not friends. But yeah, I go in the VA and I have to give them blood. And it's like, hmm, got to think about you. How long have you been doing this? Oh, you're just training. Oh, I'm not going to be the pain cushion today. I'm sorry. That's okay. And even my husband laughs. He goes, how is it that you can get needles in your ears and down your neck and down your back and on your ankles and it, you go to sleep? But when someone comes to take blood, you're like, mm -mm. I said, it's, it's the thought that I know that the person who has been doing this for me for years, I can trust him to do what he does. And he knows, okay, what she needs is to relax. So we're going to do this, this, this. And then I'm going to go away for 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to come back. I'm going to take all the needles out. His voice is very, very calm. It's not, okay, well, let me slam this thing on your arm and come on, pump your hand up and let me take, I said, it's a rush thing. I said, he recognizes if you rush me, I'm not going to do what you want. I said, and kind of, Imagine having a very large German shepherd and you want to walk them and they want to sit. They're not going to move. They're just going to sit. Well, and the VA is just trying to get people in and out. So they're not going to yep. take time yeah, to, yeah. because they're, like they're you said, there, there's so many people, you know, there's so many people. I, I had an appointment that got canceled and then was moved back two months. And then I had another appointment and it just got canceled and got moved back another month and i'm like and they the va is just like sorry and i'm like okay <laughs> so you're right like they can't keep up with the demand they don't have enough people um to take care of the veterans and and it's just really hard and so um i i'm a little annoyed but i'm also it's not a life it's just my annual appointment that just keeps getting but i i gave my blood cuz <laughs> i gave my blood and i'm like i'm not doing that again so you got it, and you better use that that dose you got. But that, yeah, I was like, you better thing. not get rid of that. And then the other thing about the V, the VA is not like I'm in North Carolina, and so all there's a chain of hospitals. They're all connected, so I don't have to every time I go somewhere give them my records. And they're, it's they click, you know, they hit. Oh, you're in here. This is your social. It's been my social my whole life. All you got, you should be able to click it and go. She's in San Francisco. This is what they did in San Francisco. Okay, she's in Maryland. This is what they, but no, it's, well, no, we're not connected. Why? You're all the Veterans Administration. Right. So if she goes into an, a cardiac arrest in El Paso, you should be able to say, we can't give her this medication because you've seen her entire file. I said, from the time I left the military, the time I entered the military, you should have everything on me from inception to death. That's how that should be. I said, because every state in the union, that's how all their hospitals are. Right. Unless they're clinics. Unless they're clinics. But if they're hospitals, they're connected. They can see each other's record. Yeah, I went to a conference for women veterans in Vegas, and they were like, we are giving flu shots, but we can only log it on our system. Here's this piece of paper that shows that you got your flu shot. Take it to your VA clinic because they keep, they don't talk to each other. So you're right. They do need to make changes. But I don't want to run out of time because <clears throat> we talked about your military experience, but and we talked about your singing and a little bit about your poetry, but that's like there's so much more. So let's talk more about like what's going on right now um, because you have a lot going on right now and any other information that you want to share. Well, I am currently and have been for the past 30 years a certified mediator. I started with the EEOC in San Diego, California. And from there, I became a life coach. And then I, I dwell, dwindle it down to something specialized which is a couple's relationship coach and a family coach. What I want to do, the goal is very simple. People bring things into relationships that don't belong. The relationships are broken before they ever get started. I am also a reverend and I marry people or I officiate weddings. I don't really marry them. I officiate the wedding that joins them together. But before I do that, I take them through a course where they understand each other better. And that relationship course is called a reunion course where it reunifies them. 
when you're living with somebody, you think you know them, but when you marry them, somehow they change and some people don't, but they do. So I work with relationships. I work with, I'm a relationships coach. I'm a certified mediator. I'm also a public speaker. I just spoke at the leadership tour and I actually spoke this weekend, but the leadership tour is at the University of Michigan where I spoke about how to build quick relationships that last. And the reason why we always are building relationships, whether we think we are or not. And I gave the example, when you walk into your local grocery store, you're talking to that cashier. You're building a relationship. It's not long-term, but the relationship and the impression you want to leave on that person is, if I come back to this store and this person is here, they have a fond memory of me, not the memory, oh my God, here comes the customer from H-E double hockey stick can I call for relief or backup plan, you know? So, and I, I let them know a story about when I fell on cement stairs, I slipped on the ice and I fell between my C3 and C4. And I heard the EMT say, if we move her wrong, two things, one or two things is going to happen. She's either going to expire or she's going to be a quadriplegic. So we need to be very strategic about how we do this. And knowing that, I had six people that wanted me to survive. I didn't even take pain medication. For the entire time, I just cracked jokes. That was my coping me mechanism from the time they picked me up until the time they put me in the hospital hallway. Um, and it was okay. It was okay to have those kind of relationships and remember, hey, I built these relationships with men I didn't know, not because I was flirting, but because I knew that they had my best interests at heart. And that's what we have to remember. And then on the end of that, I'm, as I said, a waiting officiant and I travel all over. Wherever you call me, that's where I'm going to be. Um, the business is Superior Love Forever at gmail.com. So the people can reach me if they want to, or they can just go to www.superiorloveforever.com. And I just released a, an anthology with 14 of the greatest women I know. And it was led by a visionary, Dr. Marcia uh, B. Whitaker. And she is not only a medical doctor, but she's also a visionary about this anthology. She brought us all together. We wrote our stories. Each of us have our stories in this anthology. And it is on Barnes and Noble, like I said earlier. And it went from 176,000, that's where we were ranked, to 38, and then it popped up to 16. So with Barnes & Noble, the top 100 books are bestsellers. It is an award-winning book already, and we've already been seen on CEO Weekly, Fox 45, and ABC. So we've been seen already, we've been noticed already, and it's a great thing that we do what we do because every story has an impact on how you can go from I'm here to I'm here and I have that power. I can do this. You have a village, you have a community and we're all there to say, reach out. You have coaches from all walks of life. You have trainers from all walks of life. You have speakers from all life, walks of life. Several of us are ministers. There's all these women there that you have all these resources to get where you're trying to go. Uh, in the near future, uh, I do have another book coming out. It's a novel, and that's going to either be in December 2024 or January 2025. And then several months after that, about six months, I'll be releasing a book for couples called The Couples Coupling, How to Get Through Your Relationship Happily Really Ever After. And that will be in June sometime. And my husband and I are also putting on a three-day retreat that we hope will be every single year. Uh, we want to try this 2025. And if it goes off well, every year it's going to be in a different location. Because our business is concierge, we want to keep that reputation of everything we do is Ooh. concierge. Come, join, and we want people to see other places. And the only way you can get people out of their regular routine is put it somewhere else. If you live in Kansas, I'm not going to do it in Kansas. I'm going to do it that's not in Kansas. If you live in Peru, I'm not going to do it in Peru. I'm going to put it somewhere that's not in Peru. Why? Because if you're out seeing the world, 
you can experience the world and you can grow and you can elevate yourself. That sounds so awesome. You're doing so much and uh, I'm just amazed by all you're doing and it sounds so great. So I'll put a link to your website and your email in the show notes so that people can find it easily. Um, And then I always like to end the podcast with advice for the next generation. So if you were talking to a young woman who's considering joining the military, what would you say? Before you join the military, know three things about yourself, who you are, what you really want, and what's your end game. Don't just say it to yourself. Don't say it to anyone else. Keep it to yourself, but don't just say it to yourself. Make a vision board. Make it visual. In the Bible, God says, write it out and make it plain. So here's how you do that. You make a vision board. I want to join the whatever military. I want to be here this much time. After that, what do I want to do? What is it that's my plan? And while I'm in the military, how do I want to serve? And who do I want to serve? Not just the military, but every community that you're in, serve there. You're not just there to take, give back. For me, Every place I went, I tried tried to do something that involved cancer because my mother passed away from cancer. Like this is two weeks from now, I'll be in my community involved in a 5K for cancer. And I continue to do that because I recognize that I, myself, my husband have both suffered through that and we we made it, we're here. And so to, to dream on, to help other people. But I also support St. Joseph's because I recognize that my youngest grandson is autistic, but my daughter has had some medical issues as well. And I think that knowing that those issues exist for everybody, everybody's child, everybody's mom, everybody's dad, support something. Because when you support nothing, no one supports you. Such good advice. I love the vision board and like coming up with a plan and writing it down because I think, like you said, you wanted to go to Hickam, you told people that's where you wanted to go and, and it happened. And it's just, it's amazing that when you write something down, when you give yourself like a purpose and a place to go, you're able to do it. So I think that's such great advice. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast, for sharing your story and for all that you're doing for you know, just not just the military community, but the community at large. It's it's really amazing to hear. It was my pleasure to be here. Uh, I will say this. For anyone who's out there who's ever been in the military, who is currently in the military, who wants to go into the military, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done, you're doing, and you continue to do. This country and our people around the world, not just here. We love you, we need you, and we are thankful for you. I love that. Thank you.